There's a lot of people out there who, who know the name Brian Eno without actually maybe knowing why. Or certainly, you know, not knowing the early albums. There's a lot of people who know his ambient music and maybe just think, oh yeah, he's the guy who does all that that kind of new agey texture stuff. You know, he exists in the world of high art. And, and uncompromising, and, he, and he's functioned, he's, he's produced some of the biggest records. I mean, he's, he's one of the most successful commercial producers. Let's see. Let's this is gonna be, hold on one thing. This is gonna be interesting because we're coming out of um, let's report blank Frank. Uh, Broadway Beach. Broadway Beach. Beach. So yeah. can you guys do the piano thing that's leading into this, just so we know what's going on? They're doing this thing. I'm Rob Christensen. I'm the musical director for Here Come the Warm Jets live. I must have heard Here Come the Warm Jets for the first time in high school. There were a lot of points where I realized that the, how good the record was, but I remember sitting on my bed listening to the stereo system and having that record on and hearing dead finks don't talk and just when as soon as the chicken sounds like the oh no oh no stuff started happening i just knew that something really strange was going on and that this was the best thing i'd ever heard i actually bought here Come the Warm Jets when it came out. I was already into Roxy Music. It was an amazing album when it came out and still sounds incredibly fresh today. The production, the, the instrument choices, the, um, the lyrics, the, the, the songwriting style, everything to me just was evidently, even on this tiny little phonograph, was evidently and, and profoundly different than what I um, was used to hearing from, from uh, bands, from rock bands. There's this body of songs that are just amazing. And, and you know, in the case of a song like Third Uncle, kind of, I mean, that could have been written last, last week. The Warm Jets idea came from um, a birthday party and we went from having, you know, a karaoke party with whatever songs came up to a full band playing the thing. Well, I'm doing it because I think it'd be fun. <laughs> um, this idea of presenting this album uh, would be great. It's something that hasn't happened ever. Eno didn't do it. The last time I spoke to him was in the fall, and I mentioned that we had done Here Come the Warm Jets at the rock shop in May, and he was flabbergasted. He said, why didn't anyone tell me? Th that's amazing, I, I, I didn't think anybody could play this music. And, and I said, well, you know, in fact, we're doing it again in January, and he was seriously considering sort of showing up. When we get on stage and play this stuff, it really makes the people happy and it makes us happy to do it. And there's something, I think, inherently real and entertaining about that for the audience. I think it's really unique that an album that's 40 years old still elicits this type of passion and exuberance and spirit. I, I think now, I mean, if, if Eno was, you know, the, the lone voice, the prophet out in the, in the wilderness, I think now you've got like lots of people who've heard that message and taken it to heart and, and think, this guy was a genius. Even just like, you know, the, the almost like kind of disco beat of Babies on Fire, which is so minimal, it's like, you know, even that seems like alien, you know, it's, it's just the way things are, are um, sort of juxtaposed in the arrangements and highlighted in the production makes every sound quite special. It was something that used um, production techniques in, um, uh, as compositional techniques and, and instrumental techniques as well. Um, this, you know, this has some particularly um, nasty stuff on it. It's fun to take something like an Eno Burn piece that's a dance track and you can tell it was created by, you know, they laid down everything, all the instruments for five minutes, and then they created the, the mix by muting and unmuting stuff.
to make it change over time. And it's fun to like get a bunch of people on stage and just by pointing to them. We, we refer to it on stage as, well, I'm going to unmute you when it's your time to play, and I'm going to unmute you, but in a directing and pointing at people. And it's just really fun to bring these things to life with real people and having them stop and start and having them sort of react to the dynamics in real time. And it's not a multi-track layering process. It's a real-time humans making decisions process. It's, it's a lot of fun to bring some of these real studio-based compositions to life live. bunch of people came together to do something um, extraordinary, you know, and it's not something we can do every day, we can't have a lifetime of playing this record, it's while it's fun we want to play it as much as we can. It'll be interesting to see if it grows and evolves. Wow, we're on to something that has its own energy and was kind of waiting for this moment to occur, and that's an exciting thing to be a part of, is to be organizing something that's already an, uh, an energy, if you will, that's already out there. It's one of those albums that probably kids grow up and they hear their big brother's copy of it and, and it goes on and on and it's a timeless album and um, it still sounds really fresh. Yeah, I think it would be a very positive thing to, uh, to do it again and again <laughs> and again. <laughs>